I'm Jim Horton, and this is Books in Action. We're talking with Mark Aronson, an author, editor, publisher, speaker, and historian who believes passionately in young people and reading. Mm -hmm. And welcome to the program, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. I'd like to focus tonight, if we can, on young men and reading. First of all, what is the myth about young men and reading? The, the myth is that young men, boys, don't read at all. They play uh, video games, they right? They play video games, and they do. Boys do. I have two boys. They love playing video games. But that doesn't mean they don't read. I, I think one of the big problems about books and reading is that, in, in terms of young men, is that we often associate reading with reading fiction. And when we talk about fiction, we often think in terms of a character-driven novel in which a person experiences a set of challenges and learns something about him or herself. And we, as we read this character, go through these experiences, feel deepened in our awareness of ourselves and, and our appreciation of the world. That's great. However, that is not reading. That is reading a certain kind of fiction. Mm -hmm. Reading involves, as my older son does every day, the sports section. It involves reading instructions for how to play a video game. It involves reading a manual to do something in the world. All of these are forms of reading that often young men, boys, engage in, look forward to, but adults often do not consider reading. They think of these activities as somehow lesser than reading, and therefore young men as people who don't read. The problem with this is that we then convince the young men who actually are avidly reading the sports section, the manuals, the video game cheats, or whatever the, the, the set of universe of things they're interested in, that they're non-readers. And I'll give you a very interesting example of this. I was giving exactly this talk down in Florida. And a librarian heard me, and she decided to try an experiment in her local school. She asked the teachers to give her the boys who were the worst readers. That is to say, kids who might be one year, two years behind mm -hmm. in class. But they had to have another attribute as well. They had to be natural leaders. So someone who was a natural reader who defined himself as a non-reader. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, what can I do? What can I give them to read? And I said, what season is it? Well, it happened to be the end of the football season. So what they did as a group, 26 boys came, meeting with men who weren't teachers. They were football coaches. They were policemen. They were fire chiefs. And what they did is they read each week about which teams were in the playoffs, what their strengths and weaknesses were, who was probably going to win, and the boys loved reading. Mm -hmm. They loved reading because they were reading was a pathway to something they were interested in. How was this team going to do? And competing with each other. How smart are you about this team's attributes versus that team's attributes? And seeing men who did the same thing said, this isn't something girls do. This isn't something that is unlike me. This is something very like me. So to me, once we break the idea that reading means fiction, and fiction means a novel about the interior growth of a character, we quickly discover that males, many males, love reading. Now, they may also like reading fantasy. They may also like reading historical fiction. They may, I'm not putting fiction out. They may love reading interior novels of character development. I don't mean to absolutely divide it in that way, but simply to say that once you open the door, once you move past the box mm -hmm. of saying reading equals a certain kind of fiction, you cert discover a world of boys fascinated with reading. So essentially, though, aren't... Uh uh, what you're saying is that parents and adults are putting value judgments on the type of reading that is being done. Right. Uh, if a boy is, for example, passionate of reading about history, Civil right. War, World War II, or something exactly. like that, that's perfectly okay. Right. Uh, 
Uh, but is there a point where there's a value level in reading in terms of education, for example, the classics? Sure. If you want to, if, if you yeah. still use the term, the classics. Right. There is. There certainly is. I guess to me, I feel like we have to overcome the initial resistance. If okay. you've convinced a boy that books are something, or magazines or websites, is something he doesn't do, it's going to be really hard to get him to read, you know, some great classic literature. Tom Jones. Tom Jones or <laughs> Tom Sawyer. Uh, but once you, Tom Jones you may do better with. But uh, once you've overcome that, that sense of, hey, it's not me, then there's the possibility of curiosity. Maybe I will like this. Um, so I, what I try to do with boys is show them that their interests lead naturally to reading. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're in. I once had an experience, I wrote an essay about this. I was waiting to, you know, hair for an airplane. We were, you know, a bunch of us. And people, you know, people were reading magazines, whatever, whatever. The most avid reader was an 11 year old boy who was reading a book on how to catch a certain kind of fish. I mean, obviously to him, the most important thing in the world was to learn what lure, what throw whatever was necessary to catch that fish. And to me, that was passionate reading. However, if you think of what he was doing as not reading, then you've convinced him that what he's doing, he's not doing. And you'll never get him to go from that to read The Complete Angler or to read some other book that you think uh, w would help him grow. And, and I think you've hit on something. I think when we say boys don't read, we don't just mean they don't decode words on a page. I think we want reading to have a certain humanistic value. Mm -hmm. We want them, we want boys to grow in their sort of depth and character and, and soul or civilization and culture. Those are wonderful objectives. However, I think it's a mistake to call that reading. Those are growth objectives, which we need to separate from the objective of simply having our boys or young men spend a certain amount of time reading print. Mm -hmm. That's a different objective. So every morning when my eight-year-old son has his Cheerios right next to the bowl, I put the New York Times sports section. I want him to be accustomed to the idea that there's something interesting in that paper. There's something he wants to know. Mm -hmm. So last night, uh, he went to sleep in, in tears because he was certain that Connecticut was going to beat Pittsburgh. Not that he cares that much. He just got caught up in <laughs> watching the game, and he was just sobbing because he was certain Connecticut was going to win. And so this morning, I presented him with two articles on how Pittsburgh won, and his whole day was transformed. <laughs> and uh, I guess my only point is that if we move off of this sort of negative image of boys and this image of boys as being completely separate from the world of reading, we have the beginning of a happy marriage, which can then move on to other interests and other curiosities. Now, you yourself have done a lot of writing for right. young men. I'd like to, if possible, sure. pick up some of the books here and ask you to sure. comment on them, if you would, please. John Sheska, who edited this, is the official children's ambassador uh, to the country, um, sort of like the poet laureate, although he's not a poet, the laureate of children's books. And he, too, is a passionate advocate of guys reading. So he put together an anthology and my contribution to this was I described walking down uh, the street where I live here in Maplewood with my then, I think, six-year-old son, who every time we walk down that street need to pick up a stone and throw it. From his point of view, stone equals throw. It had <laughs> nothing to do with developing his pitching arm or greater accuracy in stone trajectory. It was simply stone equals throw. And I guess part of my getting at again is that just sort of trying to appreciate boys for what they are. And, and that, that having been a boy who had exactly the same sentiment 
you know, beach equals how far can you skip this stone? It's just a fact. And so that's what I wrote about there, and I hope boys would identify. Okay, and this one is rather interesting, mm -hmm. Up Close with Bill Gates. Yeah, there's a book. I was going to write a biography about Bill Gates, and again, I, 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 when I write my books, I like to talk to my readers. So I talked to a teenage boy, and I said, what do you want to know about Bill Gates? Because for me, as an adult, mm -hmm. I think most adults in thinking about Bill Gates are trying to reconcile the two men. You know, the shark, you know, who was the, you know, the evil genius of, of the computer world, hated by all those on the, on the Mac side who feel like he stole the goods and corrupted what uh, computers should have been. Um, and then the, the global philanthropist. So I asked this teenage boy, I said, what do you want to know about Bill Gates? And he said, how to become him, and how to, you know, how to be the richest man in the world. And so I just completely transformed how I wrote the book, because I felt I had to explain how did he do it in terms that would a kid could identify with. And there is a point to it, which is that he and Paul Allen were very young at a point where everyone who was involved in microcomputers had about the same level of knowledge he did. Mm -hmm which is just like today, young people who are doing very well in designing Facebook pages, because their level of knowledge is not very different from an expert. And so the point being that in computers, we live in the world, as you know, many people know, we live in the world of Moore's Law, where computers double in capacity every two years, essentially chips. Well, that means that the pace of change is so rapid that if you haven't grown up with a certain technology, you probably don't know how to use it that well. So that means young people are surfing on that edge where their knowledge may well allow them to capture something that o an older generation doesn't see. Mm -hmm. So that's what I tried to write about. And of course, Mr. Gates invented a, uh, a Trafodata at the age of, what, it 10 or something like tra that? Trafodata was, uh, well, actually what happened is that he was in trouble in school. He was very smart. But he was sort of short, and he was getting into fights. He was getting into trouble uh, all the time. And so his parents transferred him out of public school uh, to Lakeside, to a private school, where uh, Paul Allen was already at that school because he was also very smart, but he couldn't stand school, so he would just sit in the back of the classroom and read and completely ignore what was going on. Um, and so both of those set of parents put him in Lakeside, and Lakeside was smart enough in 68 to buy, um, it wasn't really a computer, but it was a link to a computer. Mm -hmm. And so they played. They, they had room to play on this new toy. In a couple of weeks, they knew more than the teachers there because they just experimented. And like Traffo Data, Traffo Data was their first effort to build a company. It was a almost total failure, but it didn't matter because mm -hmm. in the process of trying, they gained skills, a crucial skill, which was that Paul Allen learned how to emulate a chip within a larger mainframe, which they then used when they developed uh, what became Microsoft Basic. We'll go on with books, but we have to take a break. Sure. And this is Books in Action. I'm Jim Horton, and we'll be right back. After 17 years working as a mason, Mike was laid off. I met him when he came into the library looking for help. He found a job opening, but the application was only online. Mike said he'd spent his entire life around tools, but had never used a computer. I showed him how, and he ended up applying for numerous jobs online. I saw Mike the other day. His new computer skills paid off. He's working again. New Jersey libraries are transforming lives. Tell us your story. We're back, Books in Action. I'm Jim Horton, and we're talking with Mark Aronson, who's an author, editor, publisher, speaker, and historian. And we were talking about some of the books that he has worked on for young readers. And I'd like to hold up the next one right now and ask him to give us a comment. Sure, this is for boys only. And uh, to be honest, it's not for boys only. There are girls who've read it and survived. But, uh, <laughs> 
um, I worked on it with uh, co-author H.P. Newquist, and what, I've written quite a number of books, many of them quite serious. I've written books on race and books on American history and books about my conflicts over Israel. And I, in this book, H.P. Uh, and I decided to just write, to put as much fun in a book as we possibly could and, and try to make each page unique and different and stimulating. And so, so one thing we decided to do is try to figure out what were the deadliest snakes in the world. But of course, that immediately set us in a conflict. What do you mean by deadliest? Do you mean deadliest as in snake that has killed the most people? or snake whose venom is the most potent. Mm -hmm. Because as it turns out, the snake whose venom is the most potent doesn't hang around people. So, you know, we, we had fun <laughs> with sort of playing around with that. And then I thought, if this book is going to be really fun, it really needs to have a code in it. So we hired a cryptographer to actually build a code running through the whole book. So, and actually, I will say, one 13-year-old boy did solve it. There's a hidden hidden message in the book. And then, then I thought I would take some of the standard things that are in books like this that have sort of bits of facts. So for example, I remember as a kid trying to memorize the presidents in order, and which is fun. And, and then there's certain difficult passages because there are a lot of extremely forgettable presidents, um, you know, in the 1830s and the 1840s. And you don't mean Buchanan. Uh, uh, Buchanan was recently <laughs> voted the worst president in American history, so he's less forgettable. But, you know, your Polk and Tyler and Taylor <laughs> and, and Harris and Pierce, you know, are very easy not to remember. And so I tried to think of sort of fun identifying traits um, for all the different presidents. And then I did that for the state capitals. And it was fun researching that because you now with the Internet, you can find like really weird giant statues of iguanas in some state capitals. <laughs> <laughs> So I tried to fill up, H.P. Uh, and I tried to fill up the book with as many of these um, kind of fun things. One thing I did that I, I particularly enjoyed is um, I am by training a historian. I have a doctorate in history. But I thought I'd set up some interesting hypotheticals. For example, if pirates fought against Vikings, not in sports, but in actual battle, who would mm -hmm. win? So I called up a bunch of military experts. And I'll ask you, if pirates fought Vikings, who would win? I would put my bet on the Vikings. And why would you do that? Uh, because they were uh, pretty good with a broad axe, among <laughs> right. other things. Well, the, uh, the experts I consulted came down on the side of pirates, and it was for this reason. Pirate ships were built higher. Ah. Viking ships were low and mm -hmm. open. So it was basically a turkey shoot because the the <laughs> the, uh, the, the um, pirates, I mean the Vikings, would have no protection. So, but it was fun. So it was just fun to try to think about uh, some of these kinds of questions. So that's what this book was. It was a little bit related to what I was saying before, trying to show boys that there's a lot of fun stuff to read about if you just kind of follow your curiosity. And that I will say is one of my deepest convictions is that I think one of the main motivations for reading is wanting to know things. I think we again confuse the issue when we assume that you read always to be taken on an imaginary journey. That's great. There are a lot of amazing imaginary journeys. But you also read because you simply want to gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. You want to grow in your awareness of the world. Okay, I would like to, this one is close to my heart, California Gold Rush. I'm a native California. Oh, you are. And, uh, and I grew up very near Gold Rush country. Uh, uh, so. Well, this is a book I uh, did with a fa fellow Maplewoodian, uh, John Glenn and I. And uh, this is a, actually the start of a series we've developed where we take you into the actual gold rush using real uh, artifacts and real information, but through a character we've invented. Mm -hmm. So this character sets off from Massachusetts to make his fame and fortune. And as you go through the book, we keep track uh, a ledger of how he's faring. Mm -hmm. and like many, and of course this book itself, within the conceit of the book, he's written in part to recover a little money by telling the story of his adventures in the gold rush. 
And uh, we were very fortunate in that a uh, curator at the Huntington Library helped us with this ah, uh, yes. and gave us a lot of good insight. And so readers will find how people made money in the gold rush and how they lost money. And one of the insights is that you made money by selling things to other people who came to try to make money. <laughs> we all know the story of Levi Strauss. I mean, you know, you make money by selling denim jeans to prospectors, <laughs> not by necessarily expecting to find a giant nugget. The, uh, it is one of the ironies of the gold rush that most of the people in the rush themselves ended up broke. Right, right. They, 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 never, they never made a nickel. <laughs> you never make a nickel. You make it and gamble it away and drink it away. And, but the people who supplied the goods and supplied the materiel and supplied the, as they said, the jeans. There was a story in, of a woman. There were very few women in California at this time. But one woman took advantage of the, um, of the gender imbalance and she baked pies and sold them to the miners. Uh, so, so that was fun. We just finished the next one of these, which is Oregon Trail. And we're just now starting on um, Texas Cattle Drive. So it's, it's just taking some of these moments mm -hmm. where people did set out to make their fortunes. But by using that motivation, you can also show a lot of interesting things. Well, that's very interesting. Now, I'd like to bring this one up, mm. and this one I have actually read, and I ah. like a great deal, I oh, might thank add. You. Uh, I thought this was a terrific book. Thank you. Uh, this, I was very lucky again. Uh, Scott Reynolds Nelson is a professor at William & Mary, and he set out to figure out who was the real John Henry of song, or whether there even was a real John Henry. And he wrote an academic book about that, and then um, I had the good fortune of working with him on telling that same story of his quest to find the real John Henry. And wh what's particularly interesting about it is he didn't even start out knowing he was going to do that. What he was trying to find out about it, any anytime you go to Maplewood train station, you see tracks. And every so often, you'll see a machine come by to align those tracks, to make sure the tracks stay together. Because every time a train comes by, they go out of line. Well, that used to be done by hand. Mm -hmm. And the general rule was, even though people worked in teams, you needed about one man per mile of track. And there were 40,000 miles of track in the south. And thus, there were about 40,000 men, almost entirely African American, who were the track liners. And Scott wanted to learn about the track liners, about which there is almost no information at all. But he figured out that John Henry is a track liner song. And it, it's in many, many versions. But in some versions, you can hear the cadence, which is when you have to push on the track. Well, the key to this story, and I, I have actually told kids about it in some of the schools here in Maplewood, is that John Henry's contest against the steam drill did not take place in the tunnel where most people thought it took place. And Scott instead found out that John Henry was from Elizabeth, New Jersey. He was five foot one inch tall, uh, and he was a prisoner. And the prisoners in this particular prison that he was in were contracted out to work on another tunnel um, called the Lewis Tunnel. When the prison that he was housed in, the Richmond Penitentiary, was torn down for improvements or whatever some years ago, the bodies of 300 men were found on the grounds of the Richmond Penitentiary. And Scott has proven that those men died in the Lewis Tunnel, many of them. So how did they die? How does this relate to John Henry? The reason they died is not because they're in this contest against the machine and their heart breaks, etc. It's because if you're in a tunnel next to a steam drill, you're breathing dust. And so the men died in an industrial accident that was covered up, that was hidden by burying their bodies in the sand of the Richmond Penitentiary. And the song John Henry was a coded song sung by the track liners telling the story of the men who had died in the tunnel. And Scott managed to decode that. And I then 
wrote this as a way to tell kids that story, but also tell them what do historians do? What do we do? We take something like a song and try to learn the history behind it. And so this book is meant to model to kids what do historians do? And also to show that it's fun. It, it indeed was, and I might add, this, this book was, I don't think it was written for my age, but yeah. I found it ex exceedingly fascinating to read, so uh, I, thank I do you. strongly recommend this one. Uh, thank, thank you so much. I, uh, uh, I noted, looking over your work, that uh, you're not the type of historian who follows in a particular mm. vein. You seem to work across a broad range. Is that simply because your interest is ignited in different places? Or? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think ultimately I wish I could write about everything. I would, if, if I had my druthers, I would write a history of the world from monkeys to now. Mm. I, 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 I'm just endlessly curious. And now the challenge if I'm writing for younger people is to match my curiosity with something a, a young person will want to read. So I have to find that meeting point. But I just find the past fascinating. I'm, I'm just finishing now a book uh, that was originally going to be on McCarthyism. But I came to realize that for my audience, uh, for that book, who are teenagers, don't, not only does McCarthyism mean little or nothing to them, communism means little or nothing to them. Yeah, which is hard to believe, isn't it? Right. Either as a negative or as a positive. Right. They're, they're, they're neither you know, joining up to bring the revolution, nor, you know, fighting the hated enemy. Uh, it's just, it's just like a name on a test. And so I had to think of a way to, to make that whole struggle, that whole set of issues feel more immediate. And it's been very interesting. So I, I think I'm a person who's, who, it's easy for me to be curious. Uh, I'm, John and I, uh, John Glenn and I, are just now finishing a book of, that I'm doing with an archaeologist at Stonehenge, and I'm just—it was fascinating to walk around with him at Stonehenge and learn what he's finding there. So, uh, I think I'm, I'm I'm easily curious. Okay, well, I hate to say this, but we've run out of time, yeah, okay. and I've had a delightful time uh, listening you. to you. We've been talking with Mark Aronson, who is an author, editor, publisher, speaker, and historian of wide interest, <laughs> and who has been our delightful guest tonight on Books in Action. I'm Jim Horton. Thank you for watching. Great.